We're sitting here with State Representative Yadira Caraveo. She is a candidate for the 8th Congressional District, which is Colorado's newest congressional district. So first thing, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what it would be to, for you to represent this district as a freshman lawmaker, as Colorado's newest congressional district. What would you want to bring to the table? You know, what I think um, the main thing is, is that it would be a new voice for Colorado. I would be the first Latina elected to Congress from Colorado, also the first doctor from Colorado. Um, I think that brings a lot of, um, you know, of my background that is really unique to, to me and that really fits this district well. I grew up here in Colorado, born and raised. My parents immigrated um, here from Mexico in the 70s with the, with, you know, the idea of a better opportunities for their kids. And so I was able to take advantage of great public schools. I decided at a very early age that having seen my parents give back to their community in so many ways that I was going to give back to my community by being a doctor and quickly um, after you know going through residency um, and learning how to advocate more for children and doing work even as a union organizer, I found in the first five years of practicing medicine that were, there were so many frustrations with being able to take care of working families like mine, where I had grown up uh, the you know with my dad working one construction job, able to put four kids through college, and I was seeing that a lot of those um, same dreams were no longer in reach for the families that I was seeing in clinic. And so I bring that background with me, um, the you know the fact that I was frustrated as a doctor and seeing that families were having to work three to four jobs to put food on the table, that I was arguing constantly with health insurance companies and talking to people about the cost of their medication, not whether they should take it, um, you know, the quality of their schools, the, the climate that they were growing up in. Um, and that's when I decided to run for the state legislature. And so I also bring that background of having gotten things done at the state level of having p passed a drug affordability board to lower the cost of prescription drugs, having passed tax cuts um, and um, other measures like a bigger TABOR refunds to make sure that we're helping working families um, and really focusing on the cost of uh, health care, um, voting issues, and a woman's right to choose. So I think that I have a very unique background um, that reflects the, um, the new 8th District well and that will represent them well in Congress as their new voice. You're representing, you know, we were talking about the 8th Congressional District, uh, one of the largest populations of Hispanic people that we've seen in any district. So what would you do, you know, to make sure that you are not only listening to their voice now during the campaign season, but bringing that voice to Congress, you know, as, as you said, you know, potentially the first Latina representing Colorado in Congress? I think it's something that comes to me naturally, right? I grew up in an immigrant family. I've been part of the Latino community here um, from the moment that I was born in Denver, and I've seen it grow um, and really gain power, yet not have a voice at the congressional level. Um, you know, this isn't an election issue for me. Um, I've been fighting uh, for that community as a pediatrician, where I was seeing patients from Aurora to Greeley come to see me as their pediatrician because they wanted somebody not just that understood their language, um, where Spanish is my first language, but who understood their culture uh, as well. And so I've had very difficult conversations for years now with uh, Latino families about what really matters to them, about that you know ability to live the American dream that, that I lived growing up. And so this is not going to be a relationship that I only value every two to four years, um, like so many politicians do when it's time to gain votes. Um, it's uh, a community that I have been fighting for for a very long time it's, um, and that I will continue to fight for um, as their uh, congresswoman. Is there, um, I can imagine you're knocking on, as a candidate, on a lot of different doors. You know, is there an issue that keeps coming up um, with the different people that um, you're speaking to as you kind of are out there on the campaign trail? You know, I think a very important issue that Colorado has been dealing with for a long time is cost of living, right? People are talking to me about the cost of all sorts of things. Um, and I've been hearing about the cost of healthcare in particular for a very long time. The cost of housing um, has really affected my patients. Um, those are a lot of the reasons that I decided to run for the state legislature. And it's something that I have fought for uh, as a, a as a pediatrician and as a legislator um, to make sure that we have cut taxes for working class families while closing loopholes um, for corporations to make sure that we're lowering the cost of prescription drugs um, and, um, and making sure that we're lowering the cost um, of health care. And, um, you know, it should be noted that my opponent uh, has opposed. She did not vote with us to lower the cost of insulin, something that is very important for the Latino uh, community in particular because of our higher rates of diabetes. Um, and so it, it's something that I have uh, really focused on. 
And so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the economy and move to that topic. Uh, your opponent has blamed inflation um, on the state and the federal level squarely on the Democrats. Um, you know, as a member of uh, the Democratic Party in the state legislature, do you share some of that blame? You know, and what do you think should, should be done about what we're seeing right now? You know, I think it's important to note that as a Democratic Party, we have focused on lowering a lot of those costs for working families. Those are things that she has voted against um, consistently in her time in the legislature. She opposed uh, the ability to, um, to be able to lower prescription prices. She opposed um, increasing refunds for working families uh, in Colorado. And so um, the idea of, of blaming, um, you know, inflation squarely on one party or at certain individuals when you haven't uh, really backed that up and made sure that you're working for families um, and working to lower their costs um, is really kind of um, interesting to me. Sure. You know, obviously there's a lot going on when it comes to inflation in the economy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of external factors, the war in Ukraine being just one example. Uh, what do you think should be done or can be done, you know, as a freshman uh, member of Congress to kind of address it? Because, you know, external factors aside, it's hitting people in the pocketbooks and it's been hitting them for a long time um, and you know a lot of people just want a solution. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and I think there's many ways that we have focused here in Colorado on um, issues of cost and that I would continue to focus on um, in Congress, one of them being supply chain issues. Uh, we saw that uh, in particular during the pandemic, right? There are so many different products that we rely on other countries to make that if we made them in the United States would A, um, close that, that gap in the supply chain um, and likely lower costs. Making sure that we're fo focusing on affordable housing, that's um, work that I have been involved in at the state level, in particular with renters around uh, fees and making sure that, um, that they weren't being evicted in the mid middle of a pandemic. In the congressional level, I really want to focus on um, f housing for affordable um, housing um, to make sure that people um, can afford to live in the cities that they want to work in. Would you have supported the um, Inflation Reduction Act and do you support the, uh, the president, rather, um, his plan to go ahead and forgive some student loan debt? I think there were a lot of really great parts um, of the uh, in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, in particular the focus on costs for, for families. You know, um, one with the energy issues um, that it focused on, making sure that we're lowering the cost of energy, um, which we have seen increase by focusing on an all above, um, all of the above really um, approach to energy and making sure that we are diversifying the ways um, that we draw and use energy um, and that we're, um, you know, becoming independent in the way that we um, develop and, and use energy. Um, the issues, the parts of the bill that dealt with health care in particular um, were huge. Uh, the ability for Medicare to finally negotiate prices for medications um, in a country where we spend so much of our money at the government level and out of our pocketbooks paying for pharmaceuticals that are way out of reach for a lot of people. Something that I should note, Barbara Kirkmeyer who said um, that she would not um, you know, back up um, and has taken thousands of dollars in pharmaceutical contributions and seems to be really more consistently fighting for the pharma CEOs than the people who uh, really can't afford their medications. Should there be, you know, it's so interesting, it's very different here in Colorado than it is on a national level where, you know, you all have to walk out with a balanced budget at the end of the day, and that's not been the case in Congress in a very long time. Uh, should this be part of the conversation? I mean, how, how do you kind of see government spending? Should it be cut back in some way on the, on the federal level? You know, I think what we really need to focus on in terms of government spending is that it's being spent efficiently and in the right places um, and making sure that the expense of running the government and what it needs to focus on is not done on the backs of working people, um, that we're closing uh, loopholes for, for corporations, that we're not giving tax breaks to millionaires and billionaires like the Republican Party wants to do, but that we're focusing our policy on working class people, on making sure that Social Security is well funded, that we're continuing to fund uh, Medicare, that we're providing so many things that um, people and families like the ones that I took care of in clinic rely on the government to, um, to provide such as things as basic as health care. Let's go ahead and switch. Um, you brought up um, the topic of energy, so let's switch to oil and gas a little bit. Um, you know, you've supported some more regulations here in the state, Senate Bill 181 being one, and this year it was House Bill 1348. Um, Given how much of CD8 is made up of energy producers and agriculture, um, what's the message that you're giving to them? How are you going to convince them to vote for you 
at the same time as regulating their industry? You know, what I have focused on in the legislature and what I will continue to focus on uh, if I'm elected to Congress is balance. 181 really focused on providing um, local communities the, the ability to make decisions for themselves about oil and gas production and really shifted the focus to make sure that we're taking into account safety and health of our local communities and the children um, that, that I see so often in clinic while we're protecting those jobs, making sure that, um, that we're focused on protecting jobs that are very important um, to the constituents of the 8th district, very, you know, provide great salaries um, and um, good health insurance, um, like, you know, that an important factor in, in taking care of my patients, but also making sure that local communities have the ability to protect their air and their water resources. And the district features a good amount of oil and gas, um, you know, production, like I was saying. Uh, but at the same time, we also had the EPA downgrade Colorado as a severe violator and with um, how much oil and gas production and consumption kind of weighs into that. What do you think needs to happen on a congressional level to make it so that Colorado kind of not just fits in with the rest of the country, but so that the rest of the country is moving in the right direction? I mean, what realistically do you think can be done on a, on a congressional level? I think we need to focus on funding for renewable sources, what the jobs of the future and the energy of the future is going to be, um, where we will balance um, the, the need for jobs um, and the need for a healthy environment. You know, I come at this from a, a, a pediatrician's angle, knowing that, you know, when I would make my coffee in the morning in our second floor window, I could look over at the mountains and I, if I couldn't see them, I knew that I was going to be having a lot of kids coming in with asthma exacerbations, having to make the decision of whether I needed to send a kid to the hospital or not because they couldn't breathe. So we need to balance those safety and health issues, um, make sure that we're investing in um, jobs and an energy that is going to allow us to have a healthy environment. Is there a way to do a clean transition like the one that you're, you're talking about in a way that's just? Because I can imagine that a lot of people that would be watching this interview who you know are voters in that district and who rely on that for their families' incomes might be concerned about, you know, will I have a job if I elect Representative Caraveo to become Congresswoman Caraveo. There's absolutely a way um, to balance that and to make sure that we're building um, all other energy industries in Colorado that are going to um, allow us to reduce our dependence on other countries and make sure that we have a healthy air and, and, um, and clean, clean water um, while making sure that we are continuing to, um, to protect the jobs that we already have that are providing so much for our economy and our families. Let's go ahead and switch topics now. I um, want to talk a little bit about abortions. Mm -hmm. um, so your opponent alleges that you support abortions all the way up until the day that a baby is due um, and that you'd be okay with government funding to do it. I uh, wanted to just get your clear stance on, uh, on abortion and you know, is there a cutoff date? What I support is a woman's ability to have those discussions, to make those decisions with her family, with her health care provider, without the interference of government. What my opponent wants is a national, national abortion ban, where she thinks that women are not fit uh, to make these decisions and wants the government to interfere and make those decisions for them. I think that, healthcare, that, that these issues are health care decisions. Nobody wants um, the government or other entities uh, really meddling with their health care decisions. This is something that's between women and their doctors. Is this a topic that you've heard brought up um, as you're kind of going door to door? Is it something that is, you know, common, uncommon um, in a time where we have, you know, the Dobbs decision that was made and then you all passed the RIA, which is a Reproductive mm -hmm. Health Equity Act, um, you know, this year. So, so is there a lot of attention that you're hearing from constituents on, on this topic? Oh, absolutely. This is something the constituents um, in the 8th District are very angry about, very interested in talking about, and it's one of the topics that we hear about most. I think it's interesting when um, Senator Kirkmeyer says that she doesn't really hear these issues and she must not be uh, speaking to women uh, in the district because we have had women come to us who have never been involved in politics or a campaign in the past, who are very angry and want to make sure that we do something to bring back a right that had been enshrined for them for 50 years. Let's go ahead and move on to uh, crime and fentanyl, just because I know we're getting tight on timing. Um, so in, 26, in 2019, rather, um, you supported a law to move fentanyl, among other um, drugs, to a misdemeanor. Um, and this year, you supported a law to kind of go back and reverse that to make it so sort of one gram possession. Uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, that back and forth. Was it a mistake to pass that, that 2019 law at the time? 
you know, I was very happy to support that law this year um, to make sure that we were increasing the, the, um, the penalties on fentanyl, making sure that we're keeping criminals accountable for distributing these substances in our communities. I can tell you that this is an issue that I take very seriously. I've taken care of hundreds of kids who were born addicted to different substances because their mothers didn't have ad, um, adequate resources in their community to prevent and treat um, addiction. I've seen children who have lost parents over addiction issues. Um, and so when we had to make the decision um, to increase penalties, it was something that I absolutely understood and also knew that we had to um, look at increasing resources in our community to make sure that we were preventing addiction, treating addiction, something that Barb Kirkmeyer played politics with um, and decided not to invest in these important community resources. But was that 2019 law a mistake? You know, I think that with all forms of legislation, um, we make decisions um, in, as, in a bipartisan manner based on the information that we have, and then we learn, right? And so we saw that uh, fentanyl had come into our community, it was a problem, and that we needed to keep criminals accountable. And um, this year, you, you, we already talked about that, sorry about that. Um, so your opponents also criticized you for bond reforms and not supporting law enforcement enough. Uh, given how much attention Republicans, particularly this election cycle, have placed on crime rates and the fact that Colorado is experiencing higher crime rates. Um, should some of those laws that were passed kind of, you know, as you're reconsidering it, be rolled back or reconsidered? You know, what I will say is that I have always voted to fund uh, law enforcement and to make sure that we are also investing in their ability to form good connections with our communities who need to trust them in order to, um, to really enforce um, our laws and make sure that we're holding criminals accountable. That's something that I have always supported at the legislature. Let's also talk a little bit about gun reforms. Um, they've certainly happened here on a state level. We've seen multiple laws passed that are now being challenged in, um, on a local level, at least, um, in courts. Uh, what more do you think should be happening on a federal level, and what would you, as you know, somebody who is representing Colorado, coming from Colorado, where we have, unfortunately, one mass shooting after mm -hmm. another, uh, what would you want to see done on, on that federal level? You know, I think at the federal level, we really need to focus on a lot of the reforms that Colorado has put in place. Very reasonable reforms where we take into account that we are a uh, state where a lot of people own guns, where we, you know, have a history of hunting. Um, uh, you know, my dad, my brother are gun owners, but that we also realize that in particular with um, children, we need to place reasonable reforms in place to protect them. Um, I think that we've done that through background checks and red flag laws that the majority of voters support, and that important Certainly, Barb Kirkmeyer would want to roll back. Uh, we need to make sure that we are instituting reasonable reforms that are going to keep our community safe. Uh, you, let's also talk a little bit about uh, just the campaign itself. Um, you've outraged your opponent by about three times as much, according to FEC filings that I checked today. Uh, what does that say about you know the support that you have? Does do you think that that gives you a leg up in the competition when it comes to? you know, a place where money unfortunately talks in, in politics whether you like, like it or not. You know, I think that the, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I think that the fact that we have forward, um, oh my gosh, I think that the fact that we have fundraised so well is really a testament to the coalition that we've built, that we have been relying on having real conversations with regular people who then have shown us the generosity to help um, and support our campaign. Uh, we're not relying on corporate donors. I have taken a no corporate um, donations um, pledge, and we um, are not relying on outside groups like the Koch brothers to come in and fund um, our campaign. We're making sure that um, this is happening at a grassroots level, um, and I think it really shows a lot of the strength of our campaign um, in that that many people have been able to back us up and give us the resources to get our message out to Colorado voters. And yet we're seeing a lot of these ads coming in from big groups. I mean, um, you know, we were talking in our newsroom just about how many political ads are specifically focused on CD8. I mean, is this a bellwether district for how, you know, the rest of the country could go? What's, you know, why is there that focus that you're seeing right now? I think it's a very important district, one that um, is going to matter at the, the national level. You know, groups have said that whichever party wins uh, the 8th district is going to control the House majority, and so there's a lot of focus on us. Uh, you know, on the right, outside groups think they, they can come in and dump a ton of money and buy this district. Uh, but Coloradans really need to know um, what uh, the 
stark differences between myself and my opponent, how important this race is going to be to protect their ability to make decisions for their, um, on their own on their, in terms of what to do with their bodies um, next year based on who is in the majority, that they are going to be voting for somebody that decides who gets um, a break in, in this economy, whether it's working class people like you know, my dad, um, who I saw work so hard growing up, or whether it's going to be corporations um, and CEOs like those that back up my opponent. So it's a huge um, election, one in which Colorado is going to be in the spotlight, and I think that the money reflects that. And there was a recent 538 forecast uh, that came out that put uh, your opponent, Senator Kirk Meyer, just slightly above you. Um, what are you doing in the meantime to try to make up that deficit? Do you pay much attention to the forecast or the polling? I mean, how are you going to get yourself past November? I'm really focused on having conversations that matter with people at the doors, on phones, um, and in, you know, groups of, of people, including at house parties, where I have um, you know, conversations with voters about what's really going to matter to them. Um, I'm really focused on uh, forming and forging those relationships that I already have uh, in the 8th District and making sure that I am best equipped to um, not just run a campaign that is in line with what Colorado needs, but that I will be able to represent them well when I get to Congress. State Representative Yadira Caraveo. She is a candidate for the 8th Congressional District, which is Colorado's newest congressional district, representing everything from Greeley to Adams County and beyond. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Megan. It was a pleasure.